let's get started. Awesome. All right. Welcome again to irrigation orientation. And uh, Tina, if you can move to the next slide, please. So this presentation, uh, this uh, webinar series, we total we have eight topics in total. Last week we kind of just uh, set the stage of this uh, webinar series. It's a uh, water. Why is it such a big deal in Florida? So I went through the water resources in Florida and the challenges uh, facing Florida's water resources management. And uh, in next seven weeks, uh, we'll dive into every specific topics, uh, including today. Today's talk is a layer plants tell you when to water, um, what's wrong with my yard, because we get that question a lot. Uh, so it's also like how to correct some miss irrig uh, some irrigation mispractices so, or just some malfunction of your irrigation system. So you can see this uh, webinar series uh, covers all the basics of your irrigation system. And uh, Tia just dropped the link of registration. There's a blog with all the eight topics. So you can go there to register any topics you're interested. And next slide, please. And today's presentation is uh, let the plants tell you when to water. And I have the guest speakers here is uh, Ms. Tina McIntyre. She is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent in UF IFAX Extension, Seminole County. And also Ms. Tia Savisi. She is also the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent, just a different county. And she's housed in UF IFAX Orange County. Now let's welcome our speakers and tell us how to let our plants tell us when to water. Thank you, Yi Lin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I see we have about 45 of you out there um, here to learn about how plants can interact with irrigation. And um, my name's Tina McIntyre. I am actually a, a lover of plants, kind of piqued my interest since I was a kid. And I started off in my career at the University of Central Florida Arboretum where I kind of got acclimated to learning about native plants and um, horticultural plants along with vegetable and herb plants. And, uh, you know, really just grew my love over there and have since learned a lot about aquatic plants. And I'm just happy to share some of that knowledge with you here today. And I'm also hey. joined by Tia. Hey, everybody. My name's Tia Silvesi. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent in Orange County, and um, I'm also a plant lover. I grew up on a family farm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I just knew I wanted to do horticulture my whole life. I got my undergraduate degree at um, UCF in botany, and then I went to the University of Hawaii, where I got my master's degree in agriculture. So. Um, today's webinar on let the plants tell you when to water is really important because part of being a good, you know, landscape homeowner caretaker of your own yard, but also a steward of our environment and our, you know, water system, we need to conserve the water. This will help you make healthy plants without wasting water. So you're going to learn a lot of good information today. Yeah, so diving into what we're talking about, um, we're going to start with where water comes from. And just briefly, because as you can see in the series, uh, we do touch on that in the other webinars, plant evolution and where plants, uh, where to find those plant facts. So if a plant likes it wet or dry or shady or sunny, all those types of things, we're going to help you find that out about certain plant species how to assess your site. So to look at your yard or the yard that you're working on and say, what are the conditions? The types of plants and how they indicate when to water. So we'll walk you through trees and shrubs and all that. And then talk about wilt prevention strategies. So the real theme with irrigation is that irrigation is a supplement to the rain that falls. And right now we're in our rainy season we have a lot of water. So we wanna really watch those rain patterns so we can pull back on our irrigation unless we have a smart um, irrigation, which can help us do that. 
So for the amount of water that we have in the potable fresh water comes from our Floridian aquifer. The aquifer is below our feet and runs throughout the state. And we do have the Biscayne aquifer down there in Miami as well. And so um, each species of plant will, will require different amounts of water. And so you can see here, this is actually a graphic on the bottom right from the Central Florida Water Initiative. Now they actually, it's, it's the water management districts, the three biggest ones in the state, so the South Florida, the St. John's, and the Southwest Florida come together and they sit, you know, with other utility partners and they look at the, you know, the geology of our state and the amount of use and the projected development that's going to occur in Central Florida. And they say, do we have enough water? And so here's what they've kind of get estimated by 2035 we'll need 1,100 million gallons per day. And where are we gonna get that 1,100? Well, here's the breakdown. So we do have 1,100 million gallons per day in the aquifer, but we can get an extra 50 from traditional groundwater sources. We do have about 250 million gallons per day potentially needed that we do not have. And so we're really relying on conservation watching those plants, telling us when to water and other efforts, you know, to save water and conserve water so that we do have um, available water resources for drinking and bathing in our future. So, um, and here you can see on the top is just kind of a side slice of what our state looks like, that we do have springs and lakes that connect down into that aquifer and it's you know, we're not mountainous, we are very flat and we are very close to the water table. So a lot of what happens on the surface is very close to that aquifer. And, um, you know, that is something also when in terms of water quality. So again, looking at the species that you're, will, that you're looking to irrigate, you wanna start with that. It all comes back down to right plant and right place. So for example, we have two native plant species here. Florida species that have evolved in Florida. We have the blue curls, which is quite beautiful. You can see the little beautiful purple flower pictured here. But this plant evolved in a high scrub environment, which is similar to like a desert. It's in the middle of the state, very dry, um, you know, does get the deluge and the rains and the, the torrential downpours, but it really does not require a lot of water to do its blooming. When we look at pickerel weed, here on the right, you can see that this plant has evolved in a wet environment. It's close to the shoreline. It likes its feet wet. And so this plant, unless it's planted in a wet area with standing water or by a shoreline, you're going to have to, you know, irrigate it. And we don't want to do that. We want to look at putting the right plant in the right place in the context of what those plants needs are. So Tia is going to tell us a little bit more about right plant, right place. Yeah, well, this is the first principle of Florida friendly landscaping. And so what you want in your yard is you want to be Florida friendly. You want to choose Florida friendly plants that are suited for your site and that get the amount of water that you have. If you have a wet spot, you want a plant that loves water. If you have a dry spot, you want a drought tolerant plant. And we have an excellent resource online that I will put the link in the chat box. It is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. And this booklet that's available uh, free online as a PDF, it gives you detailed plant information. It tells you the plant status, how much sunlight they need, how much water they need. And all the plants in this are Florida friendly, which means they do well in our region. They do well in Florida. And so um, that is a great resource. Next slide. Another great resource is the Florida friendly app. And this app is kind of based on the guide, but you can really select in there and get it tailored. You can say, you know, you're in central Florida, you're looking for a tree that grows small in the shade, and it will give you a list of plants that's available 
in your area there. And so that's um, available free online on the FFL website. You can see the web address there. Yeah, and feel free if you have questions as we go along, put them in the question and answer section so we can help you with those. So here's some things that you wanna consider. You wanna do a little site assessment. And what this means is to just observe your yard. And you wanna look for things like sunlight. So what are the light requirements of the plants you're selecting? What is the light availability in your yard? Um, so like six or more hours is considered full sun. Um, less than three hours per day is considered full shade. You also wanna look at the USDA cold hardiness zone. So um, right here in Orlando, we're zone 9B, but Florida can range from 8A, you know, up in Tallahassee in the Panhandle, all the way down to zone 10B in the Keys. And so find, uh, you know, some things that grow in South Florida don't grow in Central Florida. Some things that grow in Central Florida also grow in North Florida. You just need to look at the plant and the zone and know what your zone is. And if you're not sure about your zone, you can just Google um, USDA, you know, plant hardiness map and it will show you the zones. Another factor to consider is the soil and the nutrients in your soil. Most of us have sandy soil, but you know, if you're in a low lying area, you might have some more organic matter. And so you wanna match the soil conditions with the plant. Like Tina was talking about the aquatic, you know, pickerel weed that likes wet or mucky or boggy kind of soil. Then the native status, like is the plant native or is it not native? And Florida friendly, we, we don't have a preference. We accept both native plants and non-native plants, but it's good to have a mixture in your landscape. Um, native plants can be especially hardy and what we call like bulletproof. Like for example, our state tree, the cabbage tree, the cabbage palm tree. You know, that can take wet, it can take dry, it can take sun, it can take shade. Um, even like our bald cypress, that's native. And that can also take wet. Most people associate cypress with wet, but it's also a drought tolerant tree and it can take dry as well. So the Florida native plants are really well adapted for you know, our region here and do well in our core sandy soil and do well in the heat. They do well in the cold and the, um, you know, it's good to have a mixture of them. Plus native plants bring some unique um, pollinators and insects to your garden that some of the ornamentals, you know, don't have as much wildlife value. They're just kind of pretty to look at. Um, also know. water, how much water does it take? I was just going to say, I know my um, black eyed Susans and Gallardia plants were doing backflips during the drought. They looked yeah. great and everything else was wilting. Right. Hardy. Yeah. Bulletproof plants. Um, let's see. Soil pH. So this will be ranging across our state and it's good to get a soil test. See what your soil is. We want it kind of around seven, you know, neutral. A lot of people might have a range. You know, if you're between uh, 5.5 and 7.5, that's a pretty good range for most plants to grow. And we offer soil testing at our extension center. Um, you guys have it in Seminole County. And we also do. the state office um, up in Gainesville, you can send your soil up there and get it tested. Um, and then just the plant growth rate, is it a fast grower? Is it a slow grower? And um, that's kind of up to your personal preference. Do you want to plant a tree that's going to make shade quickly? Or do you want something more slow growing that you're not going to have to prune so often? Excellent. Thank you, Tia. And uh, so you, you know, obviously we're talking mostly about landscaping and um, outdoor plants, but you know, those patio plants and even indoor plants, 
they can show signs of wilting as well. So we want to think about, is it thirsty? Is it indicating that it's actually the soil is dry and it's it needs some water? Or maybe it's been overwatered. So in the case of some of our interior plants, if they don't have a hole on the bottom of that pot, it's literally in standing water. And again, if that, it might be a shade loving plant, but if that plant did not evolve in standing water, it's not gonna be doing very well. So you wanna definitely, any of your patio plants, your indoor plants, check for that hole on the bottom of the pot. It might be something that you want. It might be something that you don't want. So for example, another species that I really like, the um, Florida native swamp hibiscus, if I'm trying to grow that, I need to put it in a pot with no holes because it wants that wet environment so that you know I don't have that drainage. I'm just having that plant in a wet container. Um, where other ones, if I do that, it's gonna quickly start looking at like the one on the left with the brown and dying leaves. So Martina, yeah, what you're saying here is, you know, it can be wilting from too much water, but also not enough water. But what's the tried and true way to check? Put your finger in the soil, right? Okay. So, you know, just use your, uh, you know, best tool that you have here and just poke around in there. And especially like with orchids, they are usually, they're native to living in trees, unless they're a specified a ground orchid they're gonna be tree and arboreal type species. And so they don't need a lot of water, they subsist on rain. Um, if you do see some wrinkling in the leaves, you know your orchid's gonna need some water um, because the, the touch method doesn't always work with those orchids. So, you know, just kind of being in tune to the soil and watching your plants and, you know, really, again, going back to what species is it and um, what does this plant prefer? Now let's talk about turf grass, you know, moving outside into the landscape. With our, with our turf, we want to look for about 30% sign that the turf is getting dehydrated. So this one here, I would say is pretty well dehydrated, probably in the 80 to 90% range, right? The leaves are fully curled up. It's probably, this picture was taken like, uh, I think Tia took it last, you know, May or April, we were really dry. So, um, you know, when it starts to curl, it's okay. It can make it through a drought, but, you know, or a droughty day or, you know, a day we don't get rain here in the rainy season. But overall, if your grass is starting to show that signs, that's when we need to pull out the irrigation and help it survive through the drought. Now, we don't need to have grass that is 100% perked up all the time, especially when it's getting rain most of the time. We know that it's gonna come a three o'clock shower or something like that. So let your plants tell you when to water, look for those signs of wilting. For turf grass, the footprints that are remaining on the grass are a key indication. So if you or somebody in your family walks across it and it's looking like those, it's not perking back up, it's time to apply some water. You might also see a bluish gray hue. So in this picture that Tia took, um, you know, you see kind of a bluish, almost bluish color to the St. Augustine. It depends on the species of grass, but some of them do exert this bluish gray color in the lawn. And then also, again, a large proportion of those leaves are curled over into themselves and uh, lengthwise. So for annuals, and we're gonna look at perennials here on the next slide. But you know, you really want to think about your plant in terms of is it an annual plant or is it a perennial plant? So just some basics on that. Our annual plants are going to live one life cycle. That could be generally a year, generally a season, maybe a little bit more than a year. Each species is different, but they're really just going to live that one life cycle. So for example, my black-eyed Susans that I mentioned earlier, they are going to, you know, uh, vegetate, produce flowers, those flowers are going to turn to seeds, and then they're going to disperse and the plant will die. Those seeds that are now in the soil will germinate and the cycle continues. Each year I get my Rudbeckia, my black-eyed Susans. With the perennial, however, it's going to be living several years. It might produce seeds 
a few times um, during its life cycle. And so, you know, you're going to get a little bit more bang for your buck out of those perennials. Now, we want to, when we're selecting annuals, really look at selecting Florida friendly, appropriate annuals. There's a lot of great showy annuals that come in, um, but we want to think about, you know, is this plant going to be compatible with our season? It might be sold as spring throughout the rest of the country, but spring here in Florida, as we all know, can get pretty hot and sometimes rainy or other factors. Um, you know, they say up north, April showers bring May flowers, but we don't always have, you know, sometimes our rain doesn't come till the end of May or June. So it really just kind of depends that we want to make sure that we're selecting annuals that are appropriate for our you know, state and for the part of our state that works. So some ideas, most of these are gonna be um, applicable statewide. For shade, if you have shade and you wanna do a little annual foliage, then you can do the coleus twin flower. That's one of our native Florida plants. And that's gonna be a good hardy ground cover selection. Purple cone flower, that's the echinacea. Um, great you know, for pollinators and stuff like that. And even begonias, there's lots of different types of begonias that like shade. And sun, we have, of course, my, my mentioned black-eyed Susans. Pentas, another one of my favorites. Those are great for butterflies and very drought tolerant. Coreopsis, well, that's our native state wildflower. And there are several species of Coreopsis. Some of them do like it a little wet and they have evolved in our wetlands. So you just wanna make sure that you're selecting a coreopsis that's going to be appropriate for, you know, maybe a dry full sun area. And then sweet alyssum, that's one of my springtime favorites. It's a long lived annual, so it'll kind of live into the heat a little bit. Um, a great selection and a nice smell as well. And then the blanket flower or gallardia, those are really good and they're going to be reseeding. So, you know, that's the nice thing about our native wildflowers is, you know, even if you buy them once, you're getting that bang for your buck because they're reseeding um, and moving throughout the yard. And for perennials, again, these are going to live about three to five years, just depending on the species. And they're generally more drought tolerant. So if you think about the plant has several years to put down roots into the ground, create that vast root system and network to search for water. And, um, you know, they're going to be a little bit more drought resistant than our annuals that, you know, by the time they get up to speed, they're already producing seeds and basically on their way out. So with the perennials, um, you know, you want to look for the leaves starting to droop, um, you know, the stems might starting to bend, and then, you know, select those drought tardy, uh, drought tolerant, excuse me, perennials that um, we do have. So blue days, Kunti, that's one of my favorites. That's a native Florida plant. Um, we have plumbago and a lot of our bunching grasses. So like sand cord grass or, um, you know, Fakahachi grass, muley grass, those are super drought tolerant and are going to be able to make it through our hottest summer days. Um, and then pictured here, we also have the tropical milkweed, which is great for our butterflies. And you can even just you know, cut it back during the winter months and it will come back um, in the springtime and start forming those blooms early summer. And now Tia is going to tell us a little bit about shrubs. Yeah, that milkweed was showing a little water stress there. The, the shrubs are a little bit more difficult to observe water stress um, because they're a little larger, they can be woody, so what you want to look for in shrubs is wilting leaves and the like the new herbaceous branches that will kind of be drooping or wilting and that's telling us there's a little water deficiency in the plant. So um, again, check the soil with your finger, check for soil moisture. And because um, sometimes we get root rot, which is a fungal disease usually, and that can have similar symptoms to wilting. So if the soil is wet and your plant is still wilting, then you might have a disease problem. And we can help diagnose that in our plant clinics, you know, across the state, if you go to any extension office plant clinic. Um, also look for, you know, circling or kinked roots that can 
you know, inhibit the flow of water and food to the plant and also compacted soil. You'll see, you know, they do the aeration in the lawns from time to time, but in your um, landscape shrubs too, if you have real compacted soil, you might want to be fluffing it up a little bit, adding some organic matter like compost or mulch, and that will encourage, you know, the beneficial organisms to go in the soil and help aerate it. Um, also look on your plant for insects like aphids or other sucking bugs. They can have, you know, wilting like symptoms with the bug damage. So again, pay attention to the young leaves on your shrubs and check the soil moisture. Those are the best two ways to check to see if your plants need water or not. So tree wilting is kind of like shrubs and it's, it's a little harder to diagnose. And there's some things that don't even like, they look like they're wilting, but that's just natural. So some questions to ask, like one, is it a fruit tree? Um, fruit trees will have higher water needs in order to make nice, juicy, tasty fruits. Um, or is it just naturally like that, like the bay tree pictured on the right and the red maple? Like these are just young leaves of the maple and they naturally turn down. And once they get older, they'll, you know, perk up. But that's normal. That's the red, that's normal that they're turned down. So that's just something to know. Um, again, check for disease or pests or um, improper pruning with your trees. And trees are one of the most sustainable things that you can plant in your landscape because once they're established and they root into the surrounding area after you plant them and they have deep roots you know, think of the upper canopy of the tree reaching up while well, the roots are also just as large reaching down. So they can tap into, you know, that groundwater deep down, you know, in the earth and they're very resilient against water stress. So um, you'll see the irrigation is actually capped on some trees once they're established because they can just survive off of rainfall alone and they don't need additional irrigation once established. You know, most trees, again, fruit trees have special watering needs, you know, especially citrus. If you have any citrus left, it kind of likes to be babied and a little water, you know, throughout the year. So we're gonna touch a little bit on fruits and vegetables. Um, I grow a lot of fruits and vegetables. We have a demonstration garden at our extension center. If you're ever in Orlando, we're by the International Airport. You can come check us out. So um, fruits and vegetables have more specialized water needs and kind of like critical watering periods. So here's just some main points on the fruits and vegetables. Um, they need a lot of water, you know, steady water to make the flowers and fruits. And if you get into a drought or heavy water stress, they might drop their flower or the water stress may cause fruit drop. And so you don't want to lose all your mangoes like that. So, you know, pay special attention to them. Um, and then the frequency of the irrigation you know, it depends on the age of your crop and your soil type. If you have a lot of organic matter from composting, then your water will be able to stay in the soil longer. And then, you know, the age of the crop, if it's a mature, say like a mature mulberry tree, you know, it won't need that much water versus a baby mulberry tree that's going to need a little extra irrigation in the dry periods. So like in general, you know, young plants, like say you're starting some seedlings in your backyard, they are needing frequent but light irrigation. They don't need a lot of water, but they need to stay moist. You don't want to let them completely dry out. It's okay to let them dry out a little bit, um, but not completely. And then as the crops mature, they'll have a bigger root system and they'll be a more resilient 
So it's better to water them, you know, for a longer duration of time. So it, the water can soak down into the root system, but less often. Um, you might have heard, you know, it's not good to water every day, a little bit every day, because then it encourages the plants to have a shallow and weak root system, you know, towards the surface. What we want to encourage is for the plant roots to go deep, and that way they'll um, be able to access more of those water resources in the ground. So um, for vegetables and fruits too, you can conserve water by using mulch and compost, other types of organic matter. And then, you know, smart irrigation techniques, you know, that can serve water like drip irrigation, you know, getting a little drip line, putting it at the base of the plant so it can go into the soil and not evaporate into the air. So what you can do is make a slight depression at the base of plants. Um, you know, like you make a little well around the plant when you plant them, and that can help hold the water there until it absorbs in the soil. That helps to conserve the water too. And then most of these um, edible crops, they don't really like standing water. So I know bananas are kind of water lovers, like Jabodi Kaba is one that can tolerate some flooding, but definitely your papayas or avocados, they're just going to rot if they're underwater for too long. Bananas tasted good to you? Yeah, I love bananas. So I'll put in the chat box the link to this publication here. If you are interested in edible crops, then you should look up our um, publication here about edible landscaping using the nine Florida friendly principles. And so that will talk about, you know, plant selection and watering and mulching and, you know, planting the right plant in the right place in the right season. That's especially important for vegetable gardening. Yeah, Tia did a lot of a great job on that publication. So definitely check it out. Thanks, uh, Tina. So now we're going to talk about how do we prevent these, this wilting in our, in our lawns and in our plants? Well, one way to do that is with a soil moisture sensor. So a lot of irrigation systems um, have the ability now to do all kinds of things. So hook up to micro irrigation, install, install a smart controller, um, and you know even install a soil moisture sensor. Soil moisture sensors are designed to estimate the amount of water currently present in your soil. So you're not, you know, looking at how much is applied to the landscape or, um, you know, kind of trying to calculate or calibrate. You're actually putting a probe in the soil underneath, you know, the grass, like you can see pictured here on the right. And it's telling the system, there's no moisture in this soil. So we need to probably use the irrigation. If it's raining all week, the soil moisture sensor is happy, the system will not turn on. And so you can see it's connected into the timer, the controller, um, and the electrical going down into the, the well um, or wherever the, the water's coming from. Uh, the soil, you definitely want it to be uh, representative of the entire irrigated area. So you don't want this under an, an eave of your house or in the backyard when you're looking to irrigate the front yard. You know, obviously you want it as a representative sample of that area. You want to bury it in the root zone that the plants are, you know, that you're looking to, be, to irrigate. Uh, the soil should be packed firmly over that sensor, but not too much. So you don't want like it in a high traffic area under your, um, you know, your little trash can path or anything like that. You want to put it kind of to the side where, you know, nobody's going to really walk on it. And then again, five feet from your house so that we're not getting the eve of the house or any, you know, um, miscalculations. Because if you think about not only could it be drier by your house, but it could also be wetter because it's getting a lot of that volume from the roof. If you have dry soil, some things you need to consider, uh, which Tia had mentioned, and it definitely walks you through in that EDIS publication, uh, but it's adding that organic material, you know, really, we need to enhance our soils for a lot of the plants that we want to grow. Some of our native species are, are 
well suited for our native soils. But if we want to grow vegetables or other, um, you know, even turf, we need to enhance our soil with that organic material. So that includes compost, which you can make yourself. Um, T and I have done some webinars on compost and uh, mulch. Leaves. Leaves are a great type of mulch that are supplied to you for free by your trees. So it could be your pine needles, your maple leaves, your oak leaves, you know, put those into your landscaping beds. They're going to decompose and add a nice layer of topsoil for your plants to hold that moisture. And then even grass clippings, leaving those grass clippings on the turf, on the soil, or composting them so that it'll, you know, kind of recirculate that back into the landscape and into the system. We also have another Cetus publication um, that was authored by our colleague Tara Freeman and a, a group of other people. It's called Recycling Organic Materials to Improve Your Florida-Friendly Edible Landscape. So these are ideas for how you can enhance, how you can further learn about grass cycling and composting and um, build that organic material in your soil so that you use less water from your irrigation, you hold the rainwater better when we get the afternoon rain, um, you know, and help your plants make it through the drought. You know, a lot of people don't think of composting as a water conservation method, but really it is because if we're just irrigating on a sandy soil with no organic material, it's gonna percolate down or it's gonna run off and the plant's not gonna get a benefit from that. So we definitely wanna think about ways that we can enhance that soil. Another yeah, way is oh. Yeah. And so does mulch. Mulch yeah, is so great. Tia, tell us a little bit about mulch. Well, um, Florida friendly mulch is one of the nine principles. So mulch helps to hold water in the soil. It reduces, you know, evaporation from the water leaving the soil. And what you want to do is add about two to three inches of mulch to most of your landscape beds and, um, you know, around your trees to about the drip line, the edge of the branches. Um, you can even mulch your vegetable garden, but usually we use like a more lighter hay or straw. Um, you can use your leaves for mulch. Like when we have all our leaves fall, the oak leaves and the pine needles, you can just rake those into the landscape beds and they will act as mulch. Um, if you don't like the way it looks or if they are blowing away, you can just purchase some mulch or get some free mulch from that chipdrop.com website. Um, in Seminole County, they have free utility mulch. Where is that available at? Yeah, at the Geneva Landfill, if you're a Seminole County resident, you can go and get um, mulch. I would call, call them and see if they have any available because um, it does depend on you know, the, the amount of yard waste coming in. But typically they do have mulch available for residents to, to utilize. And, um, you know, it's one of my favorites because, you know, it's very sustainable. We're taking trees that had, you know, an oak limb that were taken down for hurricane season, mulching it up and putting it into our landscape. Yeah, Orange County has free compost available, but not mulch. And, you know, you kind of just have to call around to your landfill and, and see what they have in your county. And also if it's available right now, I don't think ours is available right now in Orange County since, since COVID. Um, also beware, there's many different types of mulch. So pine is a safe one, pine bark or pine straw. What we wanna avoid is cypress mulch because sometimes it's kind of questionable where the cypress came from. Cypress is a wetland tree and then there's the um, you know mixed forest product mulch and the dyed mulch and it's okay to use you know the red dye mulch but um, I prefer the natural color um, myself. There's there's no harm to the environment from using the red mulch, but it does fade in your landscape and it kind of will dye your hands red while you're using it. So um, just a natural color mulch is fine. Next slide. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the only thing with that utility mulch is you do want to make sure it's not an invasive species. So if your neighbor's taking down a Brazilian pepper tree or a Chinese tallow mm -hmm. or something that's invasive, you don't want those seeds invited to your yard. So just make sure you know, again, what species of mulch we're talking about. Yeah, mulch doesn't get any like heat treatment like compost does. So those weed seeds could regrow. So, you know, talking more about wilt prevention strategies, another one is just to choose drought tolerant species. And you could look for a drought tolerant species in Google, whatever your area is, Orlando, Central Florida, uh, Miami, uh, Mexico, and see what are the species that can withstand, you know, that month or so period we have of the water stress. So. Here's some examples here, like wildflowers. This is our, our state flower pictured to the right, Coreopsis. And that's a real good one. That's one of the ones that didn't wilt at all when we didn't get any rain in May. Did just fine. It's still blooming now in our garden. Um, a lot of Florida natives are drought tolerant. And then succulents like aloe, anything with that fleshy leaf, because that's actually storing water in that leaf part. So they can go a long time without water. And especially if you have those as indoor plants, um, be careful not to overwater them because a lot of problems can be caused from overwatering, like, you know, fungus or just um, suffocation, lack of oxygen in the soil. And then also your established shrubs and trees are generally drought tolerant because they have larger root systems that are going you know, deep into the earth and they can tap into some of that water underground. So here's a helpful um, EDIS publication that you can look up, the Sustainable Plant Ideas. So this is um, authored by Tina McIntyre and all and Concepts for a Sustainable Landscape Mosaics. And so this gives you some you know, different species and kind of guides you through how to create a more sustainable ecological landscape. And we'll put the link to that in the chat here. Yeah, we kind of broke it out into pollinator theme and seasonal theme. So if you want to have lots of flowers in the springtime or lots of flowers in the fall, um, there's definitely some options for you in that Edith's publication with a lot of plant tables to, to kind of discover different species. Yeah, so very now we're just gonna plant tables. Yeah. Just gonna watch a quick video about irrigation, how to easily calibrate. Hi, I'm Tina McIntyre, Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Seminole County. Today I'm going to teach you how to calibrate your irrigation system so that you can save time and money and be sure that your landscape is receiving the proper amount of water. We definitely want to make sure that we're applying the proper amount of water to our landscape so that we're not watering the weeds, creating a rotting environment, enhancing the fungus, or leaching expensive fertilizers. About 50% of our home water use goes to watering the lawn. So if you have your irrigation set properly, you'll be saving time and money. When planning a landscape, it's best to group plants by their water needs. We recommend your landscape plants and shrubs are on micro irrigation, which will directly water plants at their roots. Most of your sod will be on rotor heads that offer broader coverage. Today I'm gonna to be showing you what we call the catch can method. You'll need four to five cat cans or tuna cans that are washed out and a ruler. Place the tuna cans around zone one of your lawn randomly. Turn on the irrigation for 15 minutes. When the irrigation turns off, measure the amount of water in the cans using a ruler. You want an average of one half to three quarters of an inch throughout zone one. So if after 15 minutes, you have one quarters of an inch, you will need to run the irrigation for 30 to 45 minutes for that zone to reach the desired average of one half to three quarters of an inch. A great way to save water in your landscape is to install a rain sensor. Rain sensors are actually required by law in the state of Florida since 1991. 
irrigation is actually a supplement to the rain that falls. So if you're having a really wet and rainy day or rainy week, you can really pull back on your irrigation and rain sensors can help you to do that. There's also the option of a soil moisture sensor, which can detect the amount of water that's in your soil and help you to adjust the system accordingly. It's important to consult your manual for the brand of irrigation that you have. Each brand will have different start dates, times, and run times, and how to set it. So you definitely wanna check with your manual to see what the best way to do it is. New plants will likely need water every day, but most established plants need far less water. When installing new landscapes, be sure that you're checking the irrigation for the first three months and recalibrating just to be sure that those new plants are getting the proper amount of water that they need. Another key is to look for signs of wilting in your plants such as drooping or curled leaves. This indicates you might need to irrigate more in that plant zone or hand water to keep the plant alive. With a well calibrated irrigation system, a keen eye for checking the needs of your plants and an installed rain sensor, your plants will be getting the proper amount of irrigation, you'll be protecting the environment, and you'll save money on your water bill. For more information, check out some of our Florida Friendly Land. Awesome. So we've kind of taken you through looking at, you know, right plant, right place, and uh, where our water comes from, all the different aspects of, you know, shrubs and trees and, you know, different types of annuals, perennials. And so if you do need to water, you know, we want to make sure that we're still doing those best management practices, calibrating our irrigation system. Um, another way to do it is to check out that meter. And when you turn on the zone, you can just run it for 15 minutes and watch your meter how many gallons you're putting out so that you know at least you're doing something to make sure that you're applying the right amount. Um, and so with that, here's the rest of our series and I'll turn it back over to Ms. Yi Lin. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Tia, for your informative presentation. Uh, we have some questions here because we only have 10 minutes left. So I will just read the questions and just jump into Q&A function, uh, Q&A session. So for those who have questions, I see some hands are up. So you can put your question in the Q&A function, which is at the bottom with two uh, like chat boxes together. You can just type in your question there. All right, the first question is, uh, I've been reading recently that tropical milkweed is problematic for monarchs if planted north of Mexico, but you mentioned it here in a more favorable light. Any further information you can share? There's a lot of debate about the tropical milkweed and um, we do have native milkweed species in Florida. We recommend planting those, although they are hard to find. A lot of plant nurseries in central Florida only have the tropical milkweed and it is widely planted. So we don't tell people not to plant it here, but it does um, can be problematic for milkweeds and migration and you know, milkweed um, OE disease, I mean, on the monarchs. So the best practice we advocate people to do is to cut the plant back once a year in the fall around Thanksgiving. And that's when the native milkweeds naturally go dormant. And that will give, you know, the monarch butterflies a chance to migrate. And it will also remove any diseased plant material, you know, from that plant. So um, it's okay to have it in your landscape, but do, um, do know about managing it properly. I agree totally with Tia. Great. So next question is about mulch, because we talk about mulch. Then what's your opinion on the use of uh, Melaleuca mulch? Melaleuca is a good mulch because it's made from an invasive species. Absolutely. So that is a typically if you're buying it at the store, it's going to be a treated um, mulch so that it's you're not getting melaleuca seeds in it. Um, so it's a very sustainable option because we're using the invasive melaleuca tree trunk and they make sure that they don't include any seeds to avoid spreading it. So it's a great 
sustainable Florida friendly mulch. Yep, that's a good one. Then I have a question, actually, just a, a follow up question, because um, I know some utility or landfill, they provide free mulch, like recycle, just like you two mentioned during the presentation, the tree fell down, they mulch it. But I also heard some like concerns related to that. It just you don't know the mix of the mulch. And it may have some weeds have the invasive plants. And also it may encourage insects. So what do you think about that? My favorite option is when I know my neighbor is trimming their oak tree um, and the mulchers are there. I usually try to wave them down and get a yard or two or three because whatever insects or pests, disease that might be in my neighborhood, I'm already exposed to. So, you know, that's really best case scenario. Um, even your local landfill is probably going to have, you know, a lot of what you're already experiencing. Um, you know, if you're getting mulch from far away, that's when it definitely can be problematic. Or if, like I said, your neighbor has Brazilian pepper, you know, you just generally want to steer clear of that um, or any of those really problematic invasive weedy species. Um, you know, my my neighbor is pretty consistent. Um, you know, we have a lot of oak trees on our street. And so there's usually always some oak tree that I can take advantage of to, to get that mulch. Um, but yeah, those are definitely concerns. So something like a chip drop, you really don't know um, what you're gonna get. And that's, you know, their advertisements are quite funny because they, they state that, you know, and they, they're kind of funny about it. Yeah, well, what Tina said, like, look for, try to get a good batch of mulch, you know, if, if you know kind of where it's coming from, if you see they're cutting down oak trees or maple trees or sweet gum, something good. If you see they're, you know, didn't sharpen their chipper and they got a bunch of palm trees and Brazilian pepper, be like, oh, I don't want that one. But it is a yeah, good source of free mulch, you know, so you kind of take your take it depends how much risk you want to take and then also just being observant if you see a lot of weed seeds pop up they just pull them when they're young they're easy to pull and you know keep an eye on it great and I like just to put a, a, a little plug here because I know some extension offices, especially they afford a friendly landscaping programs, uh, are selling uh, melaleuca mulch and other mulches, uh, treated mulches, uh, as a fundraising for their afford a friendly landscaping programs uh, or their like horticulture programs. Uh, you can also contact your local extension offices first to see if they provide any mulches at a, uh, at a low cost. All right, let's move on. And still about mulch, because I Tia mentioned uh, uh, those uh, dyed black, excuse me, dyed red yeah. mulch, they tend to fade out. Uh, then how about dyed black or brown mulch? Is it better than red? It's still dye, you know, so like you don't need dye in your garden. It's just an extra thing. If you like the color of it, you know, like some people dye their beer green on St. Patrick's Day and it's just food dye. It's not going to kill anybody or anything, but it's just one extra thing they add to it, an extra thing they're processing. So I it's would okay definitely, to use it. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add a lot of the times the rubber mulch is black and brown. We don't recommend rubber mulch. So that's not Florida friendly. Um, a lot of the times it actually enhances the temperature of your roots of your plants because it's not, it's not organic material. It's not going to break down into soil. It's not going to enhance the microbes. Um, that rubber is going to stay there for a really long time. And again, it's going to heat up the, the temperature of your root zone, which is not good for your plants. And if you're in a wet area, sometimes you get the lifting and they will just end up going to the storm drain. So you want to watch out for rubber or black or brown rubber mulch um, and, and stay away from those. Yeah, mulch is a complicated topic and it's kind of personal preference. If you want to be, you know, very eco-friendly and sustainable, you're going to want to use the, the natural mulch from your property. You know, you're going to want to use your tree leaves and your pine needles and rake those into your landscape beds and make your own mulch, you know, from 
you know, when you trim your trees, mulch those up and your grass clippings, mulch those. But then when you get into buying bagged mulch, um, pine is definitely always safe. You know, the Malaleuca that comes from an invasive species, that's a good one. You know, the dyed it, mulch is still good, even if it's dyed, but then you're kind of getting into, uh, you know, just more aesthetically pleasing. Some people find it, you know, nicer for their landscapes. And then, you know, the rocks in the, the rubber mulch are, you know, we don't have that many rocks in Florida. The rubber mulch, it, it can heat up the temperature. They're not very sustainable. They need to be reapplied and imported. Great. So we have last question here. And before I ask the last question, I know T uh, Tina has put a lot of uh, useful links in the chat box. Uh, so just want to let every know, everyone know after this webinar, I will send you an email with the link to the recording and the PDF version of today's uh, PowerPoint slides uh, with all the additional links. Uh, so don't worry if you miss those links, uh, you will receive email from me. And around August, you will also receive an email from me, uh, ask you to take the evaluation survey for us. Uh, simply, it will be very quick, a quick survey. Tell us what you have learned and how we can improve this uh, series. Uh, so we will greatly appreciate it in August. Uh, when you receive that email, you can take that survey for us. All right, the last question, actually it's a really good question. Um, is it a lost cause to plant citrus trees anymore? I want to plant a lemon tree. Yeah, so citrus greening is definitely a problem and we don't have a solution. Um, so pretty much every, the, the, the citrus trees can be created in a sterile environment um, and the nursery can protect them. But as soon as they walk off the nursery um, into the world, it, the likeliness that they can get greening is close to 100%, I would say. And so, you know, you're going to have citrus greening. It's a reality of growing citrus. The citrus is typically not going to be as good. Um, now, if you're willing to kind of say, okay, well, it might only last five or maybe 10 years, then that's perfectly fine. You can grow citrus. Um, but the reality is, is the tree is probably going to decline within that time frame. Um, and so, you know, if you do grow it, you just want to make sure that you're putting the, the right plant in the right place and try to give it its optimal chance at fighting it off, you know, fighting the greening. Um, and so, you know, really that's, that's where, what we're recommending. What, what about you, Tia? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes, it is a lost cause, but if you really have to have that citrus tree, then you will have to kind of baby it along with constant, you know, checking the irrigation is steady, pest control, routine spraying of, you know, pesticides or organic pesticides, and also giving it some additional fertilization, you know, about three times a year. So that's yeah, up to you. And just, um, I did want to mention, I don't know if Tia has any upcoming classes, but I have a landscape fertilization class coming up on the 15th. I put the registration in the chat. All Seminole County residents get a free bag of fertilizer. And then we have an invasive species class coming up on the 23rd. So definitely check out those registration links and join me in the future. Great, thank you, Tina Yiling. Thank you so much, both Tia and Tina. This presentation was very informative. Thank you for your time. And thank you for everyone attending today's webinar. We hope you can join us next Thursday. Next Thursday, we will cover the common mispractices on your yard. And we have a very catch title. title. It's a, what's wrong with my yard? So you will see a lot of pictures showing you what's wrong with this yard. So if you haven't registered the link, uh, Tia just dropped the blog link in the chat box. So please go to that blog page and register. And we will see you next Thursday. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.
Take care. Thanks for coming.